Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to our annual Financial Services Spring Briefing here this morning. Um, uh, as those of you who were with us in previous years will know, the objective of this session is essentially to take stock towards the end of the first quarter of the year, um, to consider really the, the current state of the economy as it impacts us all in the financial services industry, and also to, to look at some legal developments that we think might be particularly relevant uh, also to that sector. Um, we're very pleased uh, to once again welcome Seamus uh, Coffey, who joins us to provide his insight into economic conditions in Ireland at the moment. Seamus uh, brings a, a unique perspective as an academic economist in University College Cork, and, and also having previously chaired the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, which is the statutory body charged with assessing and commenting on the Irish government's um, fiscal and budgetary uh, economic policies and forecasts. So essentially checking the Minister for Finance's homework, uh, which requires a, a special blend of economist, uh, school teacher and diplomat, which Seamus always uh, carried off very effectively. So uh, the council is independent of government and, and pulled no punches uh, on Seamus's watch calling out uh, what it saw maybe as imprudent or irresponsible policy. So I've no doubt he'll give us a, an independent and, and fresh perspective on, on current conditions. Uh, obviously, the, the last 12 months, the economy has suffered a, a massive shock from the COVID pandemic, and we're still in the throes of that. A lot of the normal economic rules and orthodoxies are out the window for the moment, and we're all scrabbling around a little to try and understand how our business and the wider economy will be affected by what's happened immediately. Um, and also then, as we try to move beyond reacting to what's happened, um, to plan a little bit for what we, we do when we emerge from this and what the economic, the new economic landscape will look like. Um, uh, Seamus will also be, be joined by Dara O'Shea, who leads our structured finance practice. And uh, Dara will look at how the UK's departure from the EU single market will impact cross-border capital markets transactions post-Brexit. Uh, the UK is attempting to preserve access to the European market by aligning their domestic regulations with EU market rules. Uh, and Dara will look at some of the, I suppose, the tensions and challenges that will bring as the UK adjusts to life outside the single market. Um, will they be able to, or, or indeed want to, keep pace with changes to the EU market rules as they inevitably change and develop over the following years? And how that then will influence decisions participate in either the UK or the EU capital market. So there'll be winners and losers there in the years ahead, uh, and we'll see how that plays out. Uh, Sarah O'Reilly, uh, then, who's a partner in our investment funds practice, will talk to us about the EU sustainable finance disclosure regulation. Um, and this is part of a package of measures at EU level to essentially to encourage sustainable or green finance and create an environment where investors can have confidence that claims of investments being sustainable can be essentially be credibly verified. It's a topic it's no, that's no longer niche or specialist. Um, it's now a core part of all financial institutions, risk and return strategies. Um, so what has you know, up to now been probably sort of a slightly amorphous concept is going to be clearly and specifically defined and categorized through legal regulation. So um, Sarah will talk to us a little bit about that. So um, after his presentation, Seamus will take some questions from the audience. So please do make the most of the opportunity to engage with him. You can use the Zoom Q&A function and I'll try to get through as many of those questions uh, as I can in the time allowed. And also if there are questions for Dara or Sarah, we'll take those at that time uh, also. So you use your Zoom function for that as well. So I hope you gained some insight this morning and find the session useful uh, for planning really for, the, for your business for the rest of the year ahead. Um, so, first of all, over to, uh, to Dara. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our spring briefing. Um, at 11 p.m. London time on New Year's Eve 2020, the Brexit implementation period ended. At that point, the UK left the EU single market. The UK was always a major influencer of the single market project, which also includes efforts to construct, implement and encourage the integration of Europe's capital markets. The EU continues to be very much in favor of integrated pan-European capital markets. Its main policy initiative in the area is the Capital Markets Union, which is the force behind major EU initiatives such as the updated prospectus and securitization regimes. Despite this, the trade and cooperation agreement, which is applied between the UK and the EU since the UK's departure, does not deal with the regulatory arrangements for cross-border capital markets transactions. 
I will give you an overview of how the UK has onshored existing EU debt capital markets legislation at the time of its departure. So the first thing I'll describe is how, when the UK departed, they onshored existing EU debt capital markets legislation. This means that the UK and the EU now have similar regulations which exist in parallel but distinct regimes. For now, the substance of the parallel regimes is mostly but not completely identical. The second is that despite all this uncertainty, this did not greatly impact the pan-European wholesale, wholesale debt capital markets in and of itself. The impact is felt in drafting and disclosure rather than in market access or transaction structuring. And thirdly, issuers' obligations have not changed significantly in the short term, but in, in the medium to long term, the pace and volume of regulatory change has not slowed down. So there is definite potential for regulatory divergence between the UK and the EU. So to tease that out in a bit more detail, there are now parallel but distinct EU and UK regulatory frameworks for debt capital markets transactions. The UK or the EU regulations include the EU's prospectus regulation, market abuse regulation, and transparency directive. These live on and continue to apply when debt securities are offered to EU investors or which are admitted to trading on EU exchanges. However, these EU regulations no longer apply to offers of debt securities to UK investors or which are admitted to trading on UK exchanges. Instead, the UK transactions are subject to the parallel but distinct UK prospectus regulation, UK market abuse regulation, and the UK's disclosure and transparency rules. These UK regulations are the onshore versions of the similar EU regulations. They basically represent a new body of UK domestic law known as retained EU law. And this was created under the UK's European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. So this basically means two systems, on the one hand, EU regulations, and on the other, the UK's retained EU law, parallel but distinct. Then certain elements of UK domestic law relevant to capital markets transactions which always sat outside the EU's single market framework, such as the UK's financial promotions and listings regimes, as well as the English law of trust, contract, tort, and negotiable instruments have not been impacted by Brexit. So by contrast with the, so by contrast with the legislation referred to above, the EU's non-legislative guidance, such as ESMA's Q&As, were not onshored under the Withdrawal Act. Non-legislative guidance provides useful clarification to market participants in respect of regulator expectations and market practice for the implementation of EU regulations. In order to clarify the status of such guidance, the UK's Financial Conduct Authority has confirmed that in relation to non-legislative guidance, which was in place before the UK's departure, market participants should continue to comply with this to the extent that it remains relevant, taking into account the UK's departure and associated legislative changes. Then in relation to non-legislative guidance, which comes into effect after the, EU, after the UK's departure, including earlier guidance, which is modified, the FCA may set out its expectations on an issue by issue basis. So by way of example, at the end of January, ESMA updated its Q&A on the EU prospectus regulation. In the absence of any statement by the FCA to the contrary, the ESMA update does not apply to UK prospectuses. Market participants may still opt to comply with the Q&A or consider it persuasive to the extent that it does not contradict the FCA guidance. So then in terms of immediate impact for the pan-European wholesale debt markets, debt issuances are continuing on the basis of existing tried and tested structures without requiring two parallel prospectuses. For wholesale issuances, Brexit primarily represents a drafting and disclosure challenge rather than a structuring or market access challenge. The main reason for this is that the exemptions under both the UK and the EU prospectus regimes are similar for now because of the onshoring. This makes it easy to structure a debt offering to avoid either or both regimes. So for example, if the issuance does not need to be admitted to a regulated market and does not need to be in smaller denominations, it's actually easy and very usual to avoid both the UK and the EU prospectus regimes by admitting securities to trading on either a UK or an EU multilateral trading facility, such as Ireland's global exchange market, which is known as GEM and is run by the Irish Stock Exchange, known as which trades at Euronext Dublin now, or else London's international securities market, London's ISM, or else Luxembourg's Euro MTF. 
and using minimum denominations of at least 100,000 euro. If they do this, this puts the issuer outside both prospectus regimes. Then the policy intent of, withdrawal act, of the Withdrawal Act was to ensure that as a general rule, the same rules applied on the day after the UK left the single market as on the day before. The aim was that the onshoring process would not result in regulatory divergence. As such, the regulatory, the EU regulatory framework and the UK's retained EU law still closely re resemble each other for now, but they are not exact mirror images. The UK's onshore prospectus regulation regime provides a good example of what this means in practice. The onshoring resulted in the following amendments. The prospectus exemption in relation to offers addressed to fewer than 150 persons other than qualified investors per member state now refers to the UK instead of per member state. References to home member state and host member state have been removed. The definition of competent authority has been amended to mean the UK's financial conduct authority. And then my favorite, the EU growth prospectus has been renamed as the UK growth prospectus. So what can be seen from these examples is that, the ex that these changes were typically transition related tweaks rather than seismic reworkings. So then looking forward to what we can expect from the UK, the fact that the rules are still largely aligned was probably driven by functional necessity in the short term to ease the transition rather than as a definite sign of the UK's medium to long term policy intent. And there are already signs of some shift on the UK side, the most immediate examples relates to the UK's listing and prospectus rules. At the start of March, Lord Hill published a review of the UK listing regime. The stated aim of the review is to reawaken London's capital markets. The review notes that a drive towards disclosure and transparency coupled with the liability profile attached to prospectuses has led to a ballooning in the size of these documents and basically a reduction in their usefulness. It recommends a fundamental review and refocus of the prospectus requirements in the UK. And this will basically be very interesting to watch even if the report is more focused on share listings rather than debt. If I were to take a guess, I would expect to see more divergence on the UK side as the financial services sector there adapts to life outside the single market and tries to innovate and redefine and rescope its place accordingly. So just to wrap that up there and I'll leave you with three takeaways. First is when the UK departed, they onshored existing EU debt capital markets legislation. This means two parallel but distinct regimes. For now, these are mostly but not completely identical. Despite the uncertainty, for now, this has not significantly impacted the pan-European wholesale debt markets. And then thirdly, in the longer term, regulatory divergence between the UK and the EU regimes is probably expected. So navigating both regimes at once will become, will in all likelihood become more complicated and onerous over time. But that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And back to you, Will. Uh, thanks very much, Tara. Um, so probably a, a recipe for uh, some sort of regulatory uh, competition, if not conflict, um, I suppose, between um, the UK and the EU there in um, capital markets in the future. So I think that it, and, and the complexity as well, I think, is the other takeaway there that uh, is, go is going to really come to the to the fore in the future. So thanks very much, Tara. So now um, I'll just hand straight over to, to Sarah um, to speak to us about the uh, sustainability directives. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everyone. The new Sustainable Finance Disclosure, Le Disclosure Regulation, or to use its acronym, the SFDR, is part of a package of measures arising from the European Commission's Action Plan on Sustainable Finance, which seeks to incentivize the flow of capital towards sustainable economic investments. The aim of the SFDR is to increase transparency within the financial markets in relation to sustainability. The SFDR is all about enhanced disclosure to investors in a standardized way to prevent so-called greenwashing. Many of our investment fund clients and indeed the funds industry in general is, seeking, is seeing significant interest in inflows from investors into ESG products. The enhanced disclosures required by the SFDR 
will ultimately give investors the information they need to continue to direct investments towards ESG products. The SFDR is automatically binding on all member states within the European Union and is being implemented by way of a level one framework regulation with more detailed implementing measures contained in the level two regulatory technical standards, which will support the level one framework. Due to the sense of urgency around sustainability, compliance was required with the SFDR on a high level and principal basis from the 10th of March, but based on level one text only. This was because the level two regulatory technical standards setting out the detailed requirements on the content and presentation were delayed due to the pandemic. The final draft level two regulatory technical standards were published by the three European supervisory authorities on the 4th of February this year. The European Commission is expected to endorse the draft level two RTS by the beginning of May. To allow the financial services industry sufficient time to prepare, it is expected that the detailed level two requirements will become applicable from the 1st of January, 2022. What this has meant in practice is that there is a two-stage compliance process with the SFDR. The first stage was compliance with most of the SFDR requirements by the 10th of March this year, but on a high level or principal basis and based on the level one text only. The second stage will be compliance with the more detailed and prescriptive level two text, most likely by the end of this year. So who and what does the SFDR apply to? It applies to financial market participants, including fund management companies, investment firms, investment advisors, pension providers, and insurance-based investors. It also applies to financial products, including investment funds, insurance-based investment products, pensions, insurance, and investment advice. The SFDR has introduced disclosure related requirements for financial market participants at entity and product level. So I'm going to look firstly at the entity level disclosures. The SFDR imposes new obligations for firms in scope relating to disclosures at entity level. There is certain information that is required to be disclosed and maintained on firms websites. Firstly, a policy on the integration of sustainability risks into, into decision-making processes. Secondly, the principal adverse impacts that investment decisions have on sustainability factors. Or if the firm does not consider such adverse impacts, explain the reasons why. And thirdly, remuneration policies need to be updated for sustainability risks. Now to look at product level disclosures. The SFDR imposes various new obligations for product disclosures in relation to sustainability. It includes requirements not only for ESG related products, but also non ESG related products. In order to determine the extent of the disclosures that need to be made, firms must classify each of their products into one of three categories. Article 8 light green products which are products that promote environmental or social characteristics. Article 9, dark green products, which are products with a sustainable investment objective. And non-ESG products, which are all other products that don't fall into the light green or dark green categories. The product level disclosures affect the following documentation. Pre-contractual disclosures, website product disclosures and periodic reporting. Taking each in turn, in terms of the pre-contractual disclosures, all financial products, both light green, dark green and non-ESG, are required to disclose in their pre-contractual disclosures to investors, a specific risk factor on how sustainability risks are integrated into investment decisions and the possible impact of those risks on returns. There are also additional disclosure requirements in pre-contractual documents for light green and dark green products. 
In terms of website product disclosures, for each light green and dark green product, firms are also required to disclose certain information on their websites. Finally, for product periodic reporting, the SFDR also imposes new disclosure requirements for light and dark green products in periodic reports. These requirements will not come into effect until the 1st of January 2022, but will need to follow the mandatory reporting templates contained in the Level 2 draft RTS and integrated into an annex to periodic reports. With effect from the 10th of March this year, firms will have complied with step one of the SFDR compliance process. By complying with most of the entity and product level requirements in the SFDR on a high level and principle basis. We have been busy assisting our investment fund clients updating website disclosures and filing fund prospectuses with the central bank to meet the 10th of March deadline. The next step of the SFDR compliance process will require firms to comply with the additional detailed disclosure requirements set out in level two by the 1st of January 2022, assuming this implementation date is approved by the European Commission. Further updates to websites and pre-contractual disclosures will be required, which will involve updating the principal adverse impact disclosures on websites to take the form of a statement showing how investments adversely impact certain indicators, for example, climate change. For light green and dark green products only, updating pre-contractual disclosures in the form of a mandatory template to be attached as an annex to the pre-contractual documentation. And finally, updating the information required to be published on firms' websites for light and green products to comply with the specifics contained in level two. As I said at the outset, the ultimate aim of the SFDR is to, enhance, to, is to prevent greenwashing and ensure enhanced transparency on sustainability within financial markets. Given the huge level of investor appetite for ESG products, the additional disclosure required by the SFDR will give investors the information they need to continue to direct investment. Uh, thanks, Sarah. So apologies, I think we may have had a little bit of difficulty with the connection there, but um, hopefully we are okay to continue. Um, sorry, Sarah, we may have just lost the um, end of your piece. Um, so hopefully Seamus can join us now at this point. Uh, great, Seamus, very good. Um, so Seamus, over to you, um, and I think you have some slides that you're going to share with us on the screen as well. Uh, thanks very much, Will. Um, yeah, just going to <clears throat> share the screen uh, and go through um, some sort of quick thoughts on the uh, current position uh, of the Irish economy and um, what it might mean, I suppose, uh, as we sit, sit in the middle uh, of the, the ongoing crisis and pandemic uh, and maybe looking to what might happen uh, as we exit and I suppose maybe a, a key um, sort of framing um, for the discussion will be who is going to pay uh, for the COVID crisis. Uh, it's something that is becoming uh, a sort of a more frequent topic uh, in commentary on the Irish economy. 
Uh, and I think just to summarize, my brief answer is that we already have paid uh, for, for the COVID crisis. There isn't a bill um, coming down the line. The bill has arrived now uh, and we have paid it. Uh, we decided to pay with borrowing. Um, there may be an issue with that borrowing down the line, but we're not going to repay the borrowing. Uh, from a government perspective, it'll all be about uh, the interest. Uh, and any change that are made to the public finances over the long term uh, will be more about permanent changes in government spending uh, rather than those that might be linked to uh, the COVID crisis. So how do you get to <clears throat> that conclusion? Um, well, I'm going to split the, the 20 minutes or so uh, into looking at, at two different aspects of the economy, given my, my background as Will went through there. I'm going to look at what the government has done in response to uh, the COVID crisis, looking at the changes in spending, and then particularly looking at whether those changes are temporary or permanent. And as I said, we don't have to worry about the long run funding of temporary changes. Uh, if it is the pandemic unemployment payment, the wage subsidy scheme, or just the, the response to the pandemic crisis itself through the healthcare system, if that remains as temporary, um, well then we can borrow the money uh, and we don't ju then just have to worry about the interest. Um, so what we actually see in the Irish case is given what central banks are doing, um, our uh, interest bill is falling, even as we're borrowing uh, tens of billions uh, to fund the ongoing crisis. Uh, and the Irish public finances are further supported, uh, at least for the time being, by corporation tax, uh, which have surged, surged in recent years. And then we look at, at the broader economy, and we'll see actually that entering this crisis was very different to entering previous crises. Uh, in a, a, a turn of phrase that's used with previous crises in Ireland, we were very much living within our means. Uh, we actually wouldn't need external support or external borrowings uh, if so required. We can actually fund what's happening at, at the moment um, from domestic sources, uh, because as we'll see, the household sector, in part supported by all that government spending, uh, has actually seen its income continue to increase uh, in 2020. There's been huge shutdown of the economy, um, and because, but because of the, the income supports provided by the state, uh, actually in aggregate terms, uh, household sector income has held up very well. Uh, yes, the, the impact has been uh, unevenly spread, uh, with some people maybe benefiting from the government supports, maybe now receiving more than they did prior to the crisis, and others particularly uh, in the services. Um, uh, the retail sector and the tourism sector, particularly business owners, suffering hugely, but in aggregate terms, household sector income is up. Uh, but our spending, of course, is down. Uh, we can't get out and spend the money. Uh, so there's been a huge surge uh, in household savings. So that's what we're going to look through uh, for the next uh, 16 or 17 minutes or so from an economic perspective. But just taking a look at the headlines and just to note how different uh, the fiscal, the government response to this crisis has been. Uh, if we take two headlines on RTE, one from July 2008 uh, as the first real rumblings uh, of the, the banking uh, and uh, fiscal crisis of 2008 were began to emerge. Uh, we see a, a rather um, worried looking Brian Lenhan uh, as he announced 440 million of cuts uh, as the, the first uh, rumbles of the crisis began to emerge. Whereas if you look at on the right hand side, uh, maybe a much more confident Pascal Donoghue uh, in the early stages of the COVID crisis as he's announcing 6.8 billion, not of cuts, but of additional spending. Uh, so we shouldn't wear the hat of the 2008 crisis uh, if we're trying to assess what's going to happen uh, during and after the COVID crisis. They are very different. And those two headlines illustrate uh, just how different they are. If both ministers were reversed uh, and it was Pascal Donoghue in 2008, I think the headline would be the same. If it was Brian Lennon in 2020, I think the headline would be the same. They were responding to the circumstances they found themselves in. Uh, we didn't have the ability uh, to increase spending in 2008. Uh, we didn't have the... Uh, uh, ability to go and borrow, uh, and those cuts were necessary, whereas now we do, uh, and the, the, the government are responding uh, appropriately. And if you look at the, the changes in government spending across the, the EU, so this is the, the EU 15, uh, and the, the, the changes in spending uh, on an annual basis, so it's kind of the summer of 2020 versus the summer of, of 2019, uh, Irish government spending was up almost 30%. So we had hugely ramped up government spending. Indeed, across the EU, 15 we were the second highest. Only the UK uh, had increased spending by more. And you can look right across other EU countries um, where there would be viewed as being uh, a large government sector that would respond to a crisis such as this. Uh, well, the increase in spending in Ireland 
uh, outstrips uh, that which we've seen across many of our neighbours in the EU 15. And in fact, given that the previous discussions of Brexit, you could possibly now leave the UK out of this chart uh, as it's no longer a member of the EU and you have Ireland right at the top. Uh, but I think for our comparison purposes, uh, it's no harm uh, to put it in. <clears throat> so there has been a very large government positive response um, in terms of spending uh, and the fiscal side of things uh, to the shock. And maybe it's the first time we've done this uh, since the early 1970s, uh, when the first oil crisis hit in 1973, 1974. The response of the government then was to increase spending um, and try to, to stimulate the economy. Really, in, in, the, in the 50 years after that, we probably got fiscal policy wrong and ended up pumping money into an economy that was growing and taking money out of an economy that was contracting. But now <laughs> we can get the textbooks out and say, is this a counter cyclical response? Uh, and by and large, it is. Uh, the economy has, by decree rather than by the economic cycle, suffered a, a significant sh negative shock. Uh, but the government have responded uh, by spending significant amount of money. Where has that money come from? Well, it's been borrowed. Uh, the government deficit has opened up hugely. <laughs> and maybe some comparisons to 2008 aren't without merit. Because if we look here at the size uh, of the government's uh, balance, uh, excluding capital transfer, so things were worse um, in 2009, 10, 11, if you were to add in um, the money that went to the banks, that was sort of a one-off transaction, okay, one-off over, over three years. But if you look at the government balance, excluding that, uh, we're probably not at a dissimilar level, uh, a deficit of maybe 16, 17, 18 billion euro at the depths of the crisis from a fiscal perspective in 2009, uh, and maybe something similar now. Uh, so maybe some of the comparisons relative to uh, 2008, 2009 uh, are appropriate looking at the size of the deficit, uh, but I think the sources of funding and the interest will show um, that those comparisons don't hold up. If we then just look at the deficits at the European perspective, uh, and again, this is just to show the relative size of the Irish response uh, to other EU countries. So just the light green bar here is just the, the deficits. All EU countries are now running deficits. Uh, and this is for the euro area, uh, a set of numbers prepared by the Department of Finance. So these are the deficits on the left hand side for 2020. And the light green is the most appropriate measure for Ireland. The darker green is Ireland in terms of GDP. Not appropriate, that's not our money. Um, gross national income or modified gross national income is better. So this is our deficit in 2020. It's close on the second largest in the euro area. Uh, the final figures haven't been released yet. We might yet get to the top of the table. Uh, and the forecasts are that we will be top of the table in 2021, having the largest deficit in the euro area. But again, the likes of lockdowns and the, the speed of reopening will impact that. But again, it just shows the scale and the size uh, of the reaction of the fiscal reaction in Ireland uh, to the crisis um, that uh, the government has pumped uh, significant sums of money into the economy uh, in response to the shutdowns, the, the, the stopping of consumer activity in, in many sectors um, and the, the impact it's having on business. So our focus here is on governments and households and you might say maybe we're leaving out the business sector <clears throat> well, what happens with the government and the household sector is what feeds through to, to the business sector. But even with all this borrowing, uh, deficits of 16, 17, 18 billion uh, over a two year period, adding another 35 or 40 billion uh, to a national debt that was already over 200 billion. If we look at the government's interest bill, how much are we spending on interest on all this debt? <clears throat> we can begin to see the differences between what's happening now uh, and what happened back in, in 2008, 2009. So this is the annual um, amount of interest the government has to pay out. We can see in the run up to 2008, it was about 2 billion a year national debt interest hardly featured as a, a topic of discussion as such was the nature of the client. It had been about 2 billion a year uh, back in the 1980s, but 2 billion a year of our income back then uh, was very significant. But as the economy grew, the impact of that interest bill began to decline. But when the crisis came in 2008, 2009, that interest bill arose and it quadrupled, went from 2 billion in 2007 to almost 8 billion in 2013. And it was forecast to continue to grow, to grow to 10, 12 billion as interest rates were forecast to rise. Of course, that hasn't happened. Interest rates have plummeted. And instead of continuing on upwards, the interest bill has declined and it's now fallen from 8 billion 
down below 4 billion. And even with the growing debt, even with it going from 200 to 240 billion, you can see for 2020 and 2021, the amount of interest we're spending is actually declining. Um, so it's a very different interest rate environment um, in 2020, 2021 to what it was like 13, 14 years ago. Uh, and this is maybe one key difference as to why we shouldn't take the, the weapons of, of 2008 or attack the crisis with the tools of 2008 uh, as we're doing now. And if you look at the government's borrowing costs, so these are the, uh, the yield on um, the, the government's uh, bonds uh, on a 10 year basis. <clears throat> Going right back to the start of the century, you can see during the early years of the 2000s, the interest rate uh, hovered around 4%. Uh, we had a, um, uh, an int uh, sorry, a debt of around 50 billion. 4% <clears throat> gave us that 2 billion uh, interest bill a year. You can see when the crisis came, then uh, the interest rate increased significantly. Uh, people were unwilling to lend to the Irish government. In fact, by the end of 2010, uh, borrowing on international markets became uh, unsustainable for the Irish government. And we had to turn to official lenders. We had to turn to the IMF, the EU itself, uh, with the ECB also being part of the Troika uh, that rolled into town and provided funding for the state for a number of years. But again, noting the difference between uh, then and now, uh, and in fact, the extraordinary difference between then and now, uh, that Ireland's interest rate um, as of uh, yesterday uh, is negative. Not much negative, it actually was more negative a couple of months ago, earlier in the year. Uh, <clears throat> but if, you, if the Irish government borrows now over 10 years, they actually have to give less money back. Uh, for every couple of million they borrow, they'll take a small bit at the top uh, and pay back less. Uh, or indeed the people buying the bonds are, are paying more than the nominal value. <clears throat> so our interest rate has declined significantly. Uh, and one reason for this, a key reason for this, uh, has been the activities of central banks uh, why are people willing to pay such high prices for government bonds? Well, it's virtually guaranteed that they'll get their money back. Uh, back in 2008, 2009, that guarantee wasn't there for Ireland. The prospect of a default was a, a live prospect. It might have been um, a remote prospect, but it certainly was there. Um, at present, the prospect of default is zero. Why is that? Uh, because central banks are essentially guaranteeing um, these government bonds. Uh, central banks are buying tens of billions and the ECB is buying tens of billions of them. So you buy this Irish government bond, you're virtually guaranteed you should be able to sell it to the ECB. You will get your money back. Uh, and that is why the, the interest rates are so low. Yes, we have made improvements in our own position uh, over the last seven or eight years uh, relative to where we were back in when the, the Troika and we were part of the EU IMF bailout. Things have improved, but a key driver uh, of the current low interest rates uh, has been the activities uh, of central banks and they are supporting governments uh, in their response to this crisis uh, and it is a kind of a mantra of the ECB that this public health crisis is not going to become a public finance crisis uh, and the ECB uh, have said that um, they will uh, continue with this stance of monetary policy for as long as it takes. Uh, it's a bit like that the Mario Draghi line back in 2011, 2012, he said he would do whatever it takes. Um, Madame Lagarde, the current president of the ECB, has promised that the ECB will maintain this low stance or this favorable stance for monetary policy for as long as it takes. So whatever it takes to get out of this crisis um, and to allow governments to get back in an even keel, uh, the ECB will facilitate this. And this is again why this crisis is different. This is a global pandemic. Uh, back in 2008, yes, it was a global financial crisis, but some countries were harder hit by others particularly based on what they've done in the run-up to the crisis. <laughs> but now, because of the stance of the um, ECB, and if we look at countries that mightn't be expected to have such low borrowing costs, um, so the Greek 10-year bond yield follows a somewhat similar pattern to Ireland, but the peak here is much, much higher. Ours went to around 15% at the worst. Um, the Greeks, are, our 10-year yield hit for close to 40%. Uh, at their peak of the crisis. But if you look at their current borrowing rates, they're less than 1%, much higher debt levels, much weaker economy, much higher risk. Yet again, because people are almost guaranteed to get their money back, 
um, they're willing to lend to the Greek government at what would be considered very, very low rates. Yes, they do require a return. It's not a negative rate, uh, as in the case of Ireland, but it is less than 1%. Uh, so if the Greek government are borrowing money, uh, and if the Greek government are rolling over the debts they had built up previously, they are now doing so at very low rates. Uh, so it is a very different interest rate environment to what we saw uh, back in 2008-2009. Um, so while there is significant borrowings going on, from a government's perspective, governments aren't in households, that government debt will remain on the government's balance sheet. Uh, and what we need to be concerned about um, is the interest bill. Um, Ireland over the last 30 or 40 years has gone through various bouts uh, of government debt increasing. It did so in the 1980s and then stabilised it went through the 1990s, but never fell. The debt increased between 2008 and 2012 during the last crisis, going from 50 billion uh, to 200 billion, but in the five or six years since, it never fell. <laughs> and if during this crisis it rises from 200 billion to 250 billion, it will stay at 250 billion. Um, and it'll be the interest uh, that becomes an issue uh, with the hope that a return to growth uh, will see the size of the debt fall um, as the economy grows uh, and that we can, in a sense, restore some borrowing capacity. Uh, because with that large debt, uh, if Ireland was to be hit with a unilateral crisis, if it was to be hit by something that just affected Ireland, um, well, then the ECB aren't going to step in and say, here's low interest rates for everyone just because Ireland are in trouble. And um, if we do have uh, a crisis that just affects us, we do need to restore our borrowing capacity. Is there a potential for a crisis? Well, we could consider this chart to be good news, at least in the current period, uh, and that being Irish corporation tax receipts, um, which have done the opposite of um, the interest bill. Uh, so Irish corporation tax receipts, seven, eight years ago, around 4 billion per annum. Uh, last year, they hit for 12 billion, uh, and the Department of Finance forecasts are they with that they will arise again even this year, uh, even further. Uh, and Irish corporations' tax receipts are huge on a per capita basis. There's five million of us. Uh, so Irish corporation tax receipts are close on two and a half thousand euro per capita for every man, woman, and child in the country. If you're living in a household of four, Irish corporation tax receipts are 10,000 euro. Of that, about 60% is paid by US companies. So for every household of four, US companies pay 6,000 euro in corporation tax to the Irish government. Um, it is a huge contribution to our national income, a huge contribution uh, to our public finances. Um, and far outstrips the amount of corporation tax being collected uh, across other EU countries. If you take that 2,500 euro per capita corporation tax figure uh, and the rapid increase in the last number of years, in France, which has much higher corporation tax rates, their per capita rate is around 1,000 euro. Per head of population, we're collecting um, uh, two and a half times more corporation tax than France. If we collected corporation tax at the same rate as France, uh, it would be uh, seven or eight billion lower. Uh, so corporation tax is providing a huge boost to the economy. <laughs> and if you look at the economy in a broader context, one of the most important measures of the economy is the, the balance of payments money flowing in and money flowing out. And this corporation tax is flowing in. Uh, and this goes all the way back to the early years of the state. Uh, and we just focus on uh, two periods. One is the late 70s, early 80s, a deterioration in the balance of payments. The government was spending and borrowing lots of money and our position deteriorated. And we ended up in a crisis in the early 1980s. If you look at the early 2000s, this time it was the household sector spending and borrowing uh, and living a bit beyond our means. And we ended up in, in a crisis in 2008, 2009. Well, look where we are now as we enter this crisis, running a very large <clears throat> balance of payment surplus. We are living well within our means. Um, and it's like if we, we wanted to fund the government spending on the crisis from domestic source, we actually could do so. The government would need to go to international bond markets. And there's sufficient saving in the Irish economy now uh, to fund the activity uh, that we're undertaking. And if we were to look, again, just at the government and the household sector, over the last 20 years, uh, I think this single chart is very illustrative of what's happened in the Irish economy over the last uh, 20 years or so. So this is sort of the balance in the government sector. Is the government running a deficit or a surplus, green being 
and the government sector a negative number below the line, being the government in deficit, uh, above the line being the government in surplus. Um, on occasion happens, they tend to be small and similar for the household sector. How does household spending compare to household income? Um, does the household sector need to borrow? And you can see during the early 2000s, the household sector was borrowing very significantly uh, for houses, holidays, four by fours, whatever it might be that we taught. We all needed to borrow for back then. But in the 10 years since, the household sector has been a net lender, uh, has been paying off that debt or has been building up deposits. And this didn't just happen or start in the crisis. It has been ongoing for a decade. But if you look at the recent figures, you can see that once the crisis hit, household savings shot up uh, and became much higher, um, saving 15, 18 billion a quarter. And in line with what we've seen with government spending, uh, a government deficit has opened up. But the balance for the overall position for the economy actually remains quite strong. Uh, if you could get all the money <clears throat> that people were putting into deposits and give it to the government, they could fund their position. So this is the, the monthly change uh, in household deposits uh, for the last couple of years. And you can see up to 2019, it was an average in maybe seven or 800 million uh, a month gain in household deposits. We were putting more money on deposit. <clears throat> but as the restrictions have been eased and imposed over the last number of months, they've increased uh, in March, April, 2020, a 3 billion gain, a big gain then in October, a big gain then in January, and in total, um, close on uh, 20 billion has gone into household deposits uh, over the last 12 months. Um, and this has sucked huge activity of the economy. But of course, the government has replaced that uh, with, their, with their spending. Um, but if we can get back to a position where households aren't borrowing, or sorry, households aren't saving anymore, um, we can and see an increase in economic activity. So in 2008, 2009, households had cut back, government was cut, cutting back, uh, and there was limited prospects uh, of economic activity um, returning. Whereas now, well, people have the money to spend, and the government has supported the income in aggregate terms across the economy. Uh, and we have a position where um, if the opportunity to <clears throat> spend arises, people may do so. And it's not necessarily even <clears throat> excuse me, about spending the built up savings. It's about returning to a normal level of savings behavior. Um, households might use the accumulated savings maybe as a repayment against the mortgage uh, or to um, improve um, uh, their financial position, maybe put it into to pensions, etc. <clears throat> but if they stop saving at the elevated levels and return to spending, uh, well, economic activity can return um, reasonably rapidly. <clears throat> and going back to this balance of payments, we maybe do have a uh, comparison we can make all the way back in the 1940s. Uh, if you look at what happened during World War II, a time of rationing, a time of shortages when people couldn't spend. But as soon as the emergency ended, there was a rapid increase in spending. I don't know what we see at this time, uh, but it is maybe an, a guide or an indicator uh, as to what might happen. <clears throat> so just to summarize, what are we going to see uh, as we hopefully exit the crisis. Well, the government's emergency spending will fall. The pandemic unemployment payments, the wage support schemes, the healthcare response to the pandemic, that will fall uh, because they are temporary and borrowing will reduce. <clears throat> However, in the middle of the, the government's uh, fiscal position, we have to watch for permanent spending. We did have a budget last October that did have what more, might call more traditional increases in spending. Uh, healthcare outside of the pandemic, uh, housing, education, social welfare. If there are those permanent increases in spending, they will have to be funded. Uh, if the size of the government is going to increase, that will have to be funded. We can't expect to do that uh, with permanent borrowing. Uh, the ECB position will change. They will keep it up for as long as it takes, but they will change. And that might introduce issues uh, of debt sustainability. Uh, and of course, from an Irish perspective, there are the risks of corporation tax. It's great to be getting it. Uh, but it is uh, the size of it means that it is a risk <clears throat> for the economy in general. We will, as people get back to uh, the ability to spend, see savings reduce. We may see a consumption boom, uh, but by and large, if people just go back to normal levels of spending, it will support the economy. And as I said, there is a key role of central banks, uh, but right around the world, they have promised uh, that they will maintain their loose position for as long as it takes. So that's my brief. Uh, summary of where we are uh, and how it might not be appropriate to compare uh, the 2020-2021 crisis 
from what we saw in 2008. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Seamus. Um, really illuminating as always. Um, quite interesting, I suppose. It's probably a, sort of a more sustainable picture, maybe than um, than we would have assumed. You know, without without delving into some of that, uh, particularly the historical comparison. I think it's very very interesting to see our our ability to service the debt. You know, as a proportion of the size of the economy now, much more seems to be much more sustainable. And then also, which actually I hadn't appreciated, probably the first time ever we found ourselves in a situation where actually we could fund a lot of this ourselves as opposed to um, external uh, external borrowing sources. So that, that's quite a change, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's why we shouldn't get the tools of, of 2008 out to, to deal with this crisis. I know the media will focus a lot on paying the COVID bill and is there uh, going to be a tax increases. But remember, like during 2009, 10, 11, what we were paying for was essentially the excesses uh, of 2005, 6, 7. It was trying to get back to a sort of a level of equilibrium. Um, whereas now we were in that equilibrium before we started. We were in a strong position. I'm not saying there won't be tax increases, there might be, but it'll be more because the government has decided to spend more money rather than having this big COVID bill that needs to be paid on an ongoing basis. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose maybe one of the other consequences of all of this is the sort of the, the ballooning size of the state now, um, you know, and, and the role that it's playing in the economy. Um, as you know, as you said, uh, uh, some of these supports will, will remain in place afterwards. We won't be able to turn them off immediately uh, and there's going to be you know thousands uh, of additional hires in the healthcare sector a lot of additional spending in parts of the economy the government has flagged this up that uh, that that that's going to take place so the state will be a bigger presence i suppose in the economy like is that going to have an impact as we come out of this as well could that actually hinder private activity or will it help it or, or is it something that you don't see as a as an issue no i definitely see it as an issue um and like from an economic perspective we would possibly describe this as being a kind of a ratchet effect. Uh, it's something that can turn in one direction, but it's very difficult to turn it in the other direction. So as you've said, there could be a, an increase in support, an increase in uh, government activity, an increase in the size of the health sector. It can be difficult to reverse that. Uh, once these things are introduced, uh, the ratchet doesn't tend to turn back and go in the opposite direction. Uh, and that would be an issue that if you have this permanent increase in the size of the government, that has to be funded. So if you do see the government introducing additional taxes, it won't necessarily be because of COVID. COVID will show up in the interest bill and that's going down. But if the government is doing additional spending on housing, health, education, that needs to be funded. Um, will that have a negative impact on the economy? I, mean, I think in some ways it'll help. Like we do need to get our housing um, system uh, operating uh, more effectively. Uh, in the case of health, uh, health is an interesting one, going back to my time in the Fiscal Council, uh, it was one that absorbed huge resources. Uh, pre this crisis, Ireland was increased spending on health by more than any other uh, government in the EU15. Uh, it got about 13 billion in 2014, and if you roll forward to 2019, the health sector got about 17 billion. Uh, so 4 billion of it went in for that sector uh, from 2014 to 2019, and it's not clear what we were getting out. Um, was there an increase in output, an increase in um, the services being provided? Um, and now, like the bill, or the, the spending on health is much larger, in part driven by the pandemic, and we clearly are getting more there. Um, but will it just consume more and more resources? Like the more resources we put into health, the less we have for something else. Mm. Uh, could that be money we could use in education, in housing, uh, in social welfare? I don't necessarily see that the size of government uh, having that sort of a crowding out impact um, on the economy, the, the state in Ireland, in European terms at least, is relatively small. Um, it would be larger uh, in other countries. Uh, but I do think we, we definitely can do things bigger. And just because central banks are offering loose monetary policy, it's, it's not a license to use money willy-nilly and say, we'll pour it into the state and see what will happen. Uh, it should be done in a well thought out fashion. Yeah. Yeah, and, and another thing that strikes me from that, um, don't think we've mentioned it yet, but it, it sort of is, is, uh, hasn't gone away, you know, I think is sort of inflation and the inflationary risk. Uh, there seems to be some, uh, some of the commentators are, are saying that, you know, it's not, not really a risk anymore. This is, the, which would be quite a fundamental change in, in sort of economic orthodoxy. Um, 
but like surely it hasn't uh, it hasn't disappeared. It must be something when you're doing this level of borrowing and spending at these ultra low inflation rates. At some point, do, does it come back into the picture as a risk? You think so? We've been talking about inflation for for ten years and it hasn't come back. Yeah. Um, and um, my central banks have had reasonably loose monetary policy for most of this period, particularly on the interest rate side, which had been low for a decade. And now it's been uh, augmented with the uh, quantitative easing, the government or central banks buying all this government debt uh, and pumping money um, into the economy. But it should be remembered um, that some money is also going out of the economy. Like what are the Irish banks doing with all the deposits they're getting? Mm. They're not lending them back out into the economy. Households are putting billions on deposit. Businesses aren't really borrowing. In fact, business deposits are also going up. If you look at what the, the banks are doing with the money, they're actually giving it back to the central bank. Um, this goes back to your point that we could actually fund this domestically. Um, if it was, if we like, it's kind of a bit of a circle at the moment. We're putting money into the central bank and they're putting it back out. Um, but where will the inflation come from? This is a question that there really is no known answer to. Like inflation was a huge topic in macroeconomics in the 1970s and 1980s uh, and how to tame inflation. Uh, and we now seem to have done that. Um, and again, maybe 20 years ago, there have been worries about deflation, uh, Japan, the Japanization of the economy. But lots of things are getting cheaper and it doesn't stop consumer spending. Food, clothes, technology, that's all going to be cheaper in five years time than it is now, but we still go up and we buy them. Um, so the fears of deflation have reduced. Um, inflation can help reduce the size of debt. Um, so like if we have 250 billion of debt, the government isn't going to repay the principal. Uh, I see questions here about should the government be repaid. Governments yeah. don't repay the debt. Uh, you hope to increase the borrowing capacity uh, by reducing the debt as the size of the economy. And, and one way the size of the economy as measured can grow is with inflation. Um, but we're not seeing that and haven't seen that for 10 years. Is it a risk? Potentially, but like if you take the interest rates, people are willing to lend to the Irish government for 10 years at negative interest rates. Um, they don't see uh, inflation coming back. Uh, inflation might help a bit get interest rates back to normal levels, like people with money on deposit collecting zero. Maybe retail deposits could go negative uh, over the next while. Uh, it might be no harm if inflation was a small bit higher, uh, but there's no prospect of that at present. Yeah, okay, very good. And I see a question here, and actually, James, if you can see the questions, if there's any in particular that, that, that strike here that you want to address, you just pluck them out, that's no problem at all. There's one question here, I'm not sure if you have this at the tips of your fingers, but it is a, an interesting indicator. The projected normalized unemployment number post pandemic. Um, like, have we any, it's funny actually how uh, a lot of the focus in the past was on the unemployment number. And, and actually, if you think about it now, it's not even being talked about, even though it's at record highs for obvious reasons. Is there any sense of how that might adjust to how quickly it might come back or, or is that a, a great unknown at the moment? So, so I think our normalised rate will be roughly the same. Uh, we were around 5% before the crisis. I think what we call the normalised or um, the, the sort of equilibrium rate for Ireland will also be around 5%. The issue is how long does it take to get there? Uh, I see the ESRI are out this morning with a projection um, that it won't be until the end of 2023. I think that, that could be, that's a, a bit on the long side, I think. Uh, we do want to get back spending money. We don't want to keep putting money into the banks. Um, and while there will be difficulties for businesses and there will be restaurants and there will be pubs and there will be services businesses that don't reopen, um, they will be replaced. It's an un unnecessary cost. We should be trying to keep viable businesses open. Uh, the buildings that have our pubs and our restaurants now will be the buildings that have our pubs and restaurants in the, in the future. But if they're viable, it should be the same one. There should be no need to, for one to shut down to be replaced by another. So I do think we can get back to that normalised rate of unemployment. I think it'll be an important indicator for the ECB. Yeah. At European level, they really won't take their foot off the gas until European employment gets back to 8 or 9%. European employment tends to be a, a bit higher than Ireland. So I think we can depend on the loose monetary policy until that happens. And I would see us returning to that 5%, maybe even a bit quicker than what the ESRI are suggesting. Mm. Okay, very good. And uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. I might just sort of uh, wrap up quickly on this one, but it wouldn't be a chat about uh, the Irish economy without talk about house prices. Um, uh, just a question here that strikes me uh, due to the, the, that those high levels of household savings. Do you see that having an impact on, on house prices when, when we start to come out of this? <clears throat> yeah, I guess it depends on who's doing the saving. Are they interested in buying houses? Yeah. Um, I, we're unlikely, I think, to see a significant um, residential investment property surge 
um, for, from people buying properties for, for investment purposes. Um, we've seen a big switch in Ireland from individual to investor, institutional investors. Uh, is it potential home buyers who have the savings and they now have a deposit more uh, quickly? Possibly, I think that would be the case. And given our limited supply, even any increase in demand uh, is going to drive up uh, house prices. And if customers or if potential buyers have bigger deposits, it means that they can work easily or within the central bank rules uh, and the amount they're willing to be prepared to pay will increase. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think indications that uh, house prices will rise are probably accurate because one, the demand will be increased. People have a greater capacity to pay. And two, construction has been shut for the last four months. Mm -hmm. uh, so supply will be low. Um, we are seeing people buying secondhand houses. That's actually has increased significantly over the last number of years. But where first time buyers uh, are still well below sort of an equilibrium position would be for new houses. Um, and a lot of focus tends to go on that. But if the second hand houses are available, they are buying them. But I do think upward pressure on prices is likely. I don't know whether it be sustained uh, once those savings are used and once supply comes back on track. Mm. Uh, maybe that, that we get back to a, a normal like Irish house price in aggregate terms have been stable for, for two or three years, unusually stable. Mm. We've usually been going through either 20% inflation or 20% deflation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we will see some moderate inflation, uh, but not quite sure how sustained it will be. Okay, very good. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if we can bring Sarah and Dara on there. I see one or two questions um, there. Uh, can we pop up? Great, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, there was a question there. Um, uh, in relation to the SFDR, it, it appears to be all about additional disclosures. But is there any monitoring or checking of those disclosures by external bodies, you know, subsequently, or is that up to the the, the business itself to ensure sort of ongoing compliance? Well, I can only talk about the investment fund side. And um, so the central bank, um, with the updates that were required for the tenth of March, there was a fast track approval process. <clears throat> so the central bank didn't review those, so they were submitted. And um, it hasn't been confirmed yet that whether the level two requirements will, will the central bank will facilitate a fast track process. Um, so that needs to be confirmed. They may review um, on a detailed basis the disclosures for SFDR and prospectus. Okay, okay, thanks, Sarah. And uh, Dara, actually quick quick one here as well, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, I suppose on the basis that the UK exchanges uh, won't have EU uh, regulated market status any longer, it, it, does that have an impact uh, on actually something Seamus is talking about as well, uh, on the eligibility for the ECB's bond purchase program for, for uh, debt instruments on those markets? Yeah, so basically it probably will impact to a certain degree because basically the eligibility rules for the ECB's pandemic emergency purchase program, PEP, and the ECG, ECB's general rules on eligibility for collateral do have jurisdictional limits. So that'll basically mean that UK issuers issuing in, in GPPs or Great Britain pounds, essentially sterling, um, will, won't, won't, won't be able to access those programs anymore. But basically how, how you could get around that to a certain degree is for uh, third country issuers such as UK issuers can set up SPVs, for instance, in Ireland, because we're one of the biggest uh, SPV uh, jurisdictions for establishing SPVs for debt issuances. They could set up a SPV here and issue through that um, and and still in, still in sterling, essentially. And then in terms of the London Stock Exchange, if you've debt listed there, once, once you, when you when you list your debt there now to a certain degree, it's 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 automatically listed as well on Milan's bond vision. So basically, that will give that means which is also an ECB um, approved exchange essentially. Okay, very good. Okay, okay, very good. Thanks, sir. Okay, well, look, I think um, we're at our time. or just have nudged over it. Um, actually, and if I could just uh, quickly, a bit of, bit of housekeeping, if people uh, could take the, the survey, which will pop up on the screen afterwards, it gives us an idea of future topics or, or things that people might be interested in. So that uh, would be appreciated. It just remains for me to, to thank Seamus again. Seamus, as always, um, very insightful um, and really well uh, interpreted for us. So thanks very much for your, for your contribution today. And thanks also to everybody who has joined us. Hopefully that will give you some help in, in, in your planning for the year ahead. 
and any further questions or anything, uh, obviously feel free to get in contact by, by email afterwards. So thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.